tell me about Sinatra. What was was Sinatra really the bad boy at MGM mm. in those days? He could have been. You know, he made some terrible pictures, but uh, he's frank. He was more frank than he was later on. He was tougher at that time. How and, was that? Well, he was harder to deal with, you know. He's, Can you give me an example? Well, you, are you using this on, the, on, on paper? No, let me take, don't, don't do that, because right. I have to, I have to because live Because there was a lot of his being suspended, and then, you know, threatened. There's, there's, the, there's the great Jack Kessler story of when Frank and Ava went down and shot up some little town, and, yeah. and how Kessler had to go there no, with, I, I, uh, with a, a, a suitcase filled with $100,000 to pay the little townsfolk off. So he was getting suspended a lot when he was at MGM. Well, I, I don't remember that. You don't remember that? No, my so, so he didn't stand out on the lot as kind of the Peck's bad boy. You don't remember not any really. of that? Not really. Even when I worked with him later on, he, the only thing he'd do is throw firebombs and everything with it when they're on location to you know, have fun, dump water on people. And the, the gang, there were five of them, they were always doing those things. No, but he, he, was, he, was, he did his work. The only thing you had to do with him was be ready for him, Give him the one take, it's all he'd give, and cut and go on to the next. Tell me the story about, about the test of Marilyn Monroe that you told huh. me before. Well, I, uh, the picture that being made was, okay. anyway, I got a call from, I was up in my office, I got a call to go down to stage six and stand by, we're gonna do a, a test of the clothing that uh, Mar Marilyn's gonna wear, and uh, just stand by and help. So I got down, she came in from another direction, and she, I introduced myself to her, you know, she was a knockout. And uh, I said, we're ready, Miss Monroe, and I, the cameras were lined up. And what, what uh, the head of the studio liked, uh, LB, was to have a full circle of the figure, on straight, second, third, all the way, and you just hold for about three minutes, two minutes here for that, two minutes here, two minutes, two minutes here. And I looked at her dress in front, and the crotch was almost open, it was way down. And uh, I didn't know, I was, well, how am I gonna tell her? <laughs> so, so we didn't tell her, but we did. She couldn't see what we could see. And uh, we put a notice, crotch too long, you know, on the screen that she couldn't see. And uh, we, we, everybody started laughing, and she didn't know what it was, and of course I didn't say anything anymore. But she, she was a doll of a lady. She was nice and willing. Well, she was just a kid then. She, uh, Had the, she made any movies then? Did she date? Had she made any movies by then? She had made two, I think. Was it like after Asphalt Jungle? Asphalt Jungle was the one they were doing then. Oh, so this was a test for Asphalt, Asphalt Jungle? Jungle? right. I didn't even know Asphalt, ju Asphalt the Jungle. The costume, was she was here. already in the picture, but this was what she was gonna wear. See, every actor or actress at, the, at that studio had okay, their clothes had to be okay, what they wore every scene. I didn't even know that uh, MGM made Asphalt Jungle. Yeah. I didn't know that. Good movie. Yeah, I thought it was someplace, some uh, something else. It was shot on a, in a distant kind of a place, but it was uh, very much uh, MGM. So Houston was working for L.B. Mayer in those days, yeah. huh? L.B. came on the set one day. There was a leak in the roof. That, who cared, you know? And uh, the, everybody was out there trying to fix it because they heard he was coming down. And he came down and he, he came up to me. He said, what, what's happening? I said, there's a leak in the roof. You know? And he, he, and he was looking up, and I felt like a giant next to him. I didn't know what to do. And I was, you know, uh, I'll be Bayer, and I'm nothing. He, he said, what do you do? I said, I'm a first assistant on this picture. And uh, I'm, you know, running the company. He said, oh, I never saw you before. I said, well, I haven't been here too long. And that was it. I don't know, I don't remember why he came down the stage. I think a new director was about to direct that picture, I think. Well, was it true that, that Elizabeth Taylor was always with her mother? Well, I never saw her with her mother, but I saw the men around her. She was 17, she'd knock you dead. Purple, uh, you, there was nothing like her at that time of her life. Beautiful. Those, those violet eyes. Uh, yeah, violet is right. And tell, she tell told me... Tell me about the, water, the waterworks. Waterworks? The, the, the big uh, Esther Williams thing. Esther Williams. Well, you've seen on the, how the girls all line up one by one, they fall in. Well, Esther, what she, she, what she always wanted to make jokes with me. So she did finish her number swimming, and she'd come close to the, the bed, and then she'd grab me and try to pull me in the water. 
So I, I said, no, no more, baby. I'm far away from it, don't you think? One day she caught me and whap, I was in the water. But she, boy, she was great. She was a lot of fun. She was a, one of the highest paid uh, members of that time. She got, I think, seven or 8000 a, a month, I think, something like that. How about Jane Powell? What was that whole group like? The ones that, the, all those singers. We never well, went to Well, yes, I know. I didn't live, you know who lived right next door to me? Jane Powell. We both were in two little houses just off Pico Boulevard. She went, and my daughter and she became buddies. She was a young kid then. And they sort of grew up together. How about Rosalind Russell? Well, Rosalind Russell was not was an MGM artist. No, she wasn't. No. Which Jane did all those musical numbers and dances, and she she was in the Bride of Four, the Brothers Brides, you know. The, Brides to Seven Brothers. Yeah. What about Margaret O'Brien? Were you there when she was know. still She was child? there, but I didn't know her. You I didn't, didn't know her. I, know. Okay. I know her now, but I didn't know her then. Yeah, because she was amazing as yeah, a child. She was great. What was Tony Curtis like? To work? You only worked on that one movie, Beachhead, yeah. with him. Yeah. Uh, I want to kill him, but otherwise. <laughs> what was he like? Was he was he? Well, Tony at that time was starting to move up, which was good, but then he got into such bad way of life, and and he, a very strange thing happened. My wife and I were walking in a place where the kids rode ponies, and he was walking past us. He went right by me, and then as he went by, he says, "I don't like you." And I thought, Jesus, what's it? Well, that's when he was starting that stuff, I guess. And he was balance was off. And, but he cleaned his act up the last, you know, the last seven, eight years. He, he's an artist now, and he, if you call that a good art. Well, what was he like? Was he clumsy? I mean, what was he like? He wasn't clumsy. Like he, was, uh, he was a young guy showing his muscle, you know. And he was good. He was physically good. I mean, good was he able to, like, do a lot? I mean, there are probably some actors who are not that physical, not that able to do a lot of things. Well, he was physically fine. He was an, he's athletic. He didn't have any problems with that. Was there anybody who wasn't? Well, there are a lot of people with two feet <laughs> would fall over their feet. Because a lot of the old time guys seem very still on the frame. Yeah. They don't do much. They just kind of stand around. Right? Well, you see, well, filmmaking really is is face up here. The stories are told by the eyes, you know. So you don't stay too long on those kind of. You're really up where the stories be listening, not necessarily speaking. Listening and cut away from somebody else speaking. You know, back. And the, the, the way the thing was, the picture, the way it was set, was really the best way to see all the faces now. With the way it is now, it's a whole different game. And you know, for a while when they had this, they brought the film down to the thigh size down all about this, and the, and so you had a, a It was hard to make a real good shot because you couldn't hold all the people in the side at the same time. And it, uh, it's that big thing that Fox invented, and after about ten years, it became a, that got rid of it. But. Cameras are different now. Everything is different. It was in those days. So, so those close-ups. In other words, that's what you're saying. That the close-ups. Close-ups tells the story. Yeah. Can you say that again? It's t the close-ups are really t the face. The face, the eyes. Not so much the close-up. It's the eyes. If you look, if you watch pictures, you'll see how much the eyes transmit the feelings and the story and all that stuff. That's my opinion. Somebody else might have another opinion. But did you also notice that? Uh, They'd be on a close-up of the actress, and they wouldn't necessarily go to the other one. They off-screen. They'd play a scene, and play it some more, and not cut around like they do now. They all cut around all the time. Or they'll come back over their head on it, and not come off their face as they come back behind their head. And it, it was a different way of making films. Really, I think a better way. You know, and too much. Well, a tele television cut, 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 bang, bang, bang. I know the makeup people are so much a part of that. Every face was made up, and believe me, it was made up. Even when they went to a premiere or anything, the studio put the clothes on them, put the shoes on them, put the chauffeur on them, take care of them. It's, uh, if you take all the makeup off all that, they, they walk right by, you wouldn't know them. I used to meet Buddy Grable when I was at Fox at 5 o'clock in the morning for makeup, 5 o'clock in the morning. I didn't know who she was when she came in. I saw this wild hair and the whole stuff, and then by the time the shoot, she was gorgeous. <laughs> With the makeup, and she was a terrific girl too. Well, that see, that's interesting because um, uh, Springer told me that Crawford was that way. Yeah. She wouldn't even be seen outside unless she yeah. was like completely, completely made up. Yeah. I got very friendly with Crawford in late life with her. I don't know why she was always calling me and talking to me. Well, how am I doing? And she, uh, and we were shooting at a picture in New York, and she came and watched us from a, a balcony down. She was sad, though. Her last part of her life was lousy. Yeah. 
at MGM, were the directors assigned to the to the stars because of relationships? I mean, was there like that kind of George Cukor phenomenon well, that went the, on well, that they they kind of you know like it is now actresses they demand certain directors well, were they able to do that? It wasn't that they then? demanded. I, I think they were approved to do the picture as a, as a director. And as they got better, of course, they got more power. You know, Mervyn LaRoy is one of the top directors there. There are a lot of great directors there. And uh, if I could think of the director from Angel of the Outfield, he was a, he had, he did a lot of wonderful pictures. Right. But right. The, they they had the greatest directors in the world there and it was because they were treated so well. They were given so much help. And I, as I always said. If you can't make it with the crew that you get in a movie, you say you might have quit. You have 35 to 70 people behind you to help you. You know, and my first picture director, I got in one position. I didn't know how to make the shot. I didn't know where to put it because I try. I could. It would be. A, I'd be out of the in the wrong position. And a grip came alongside of me and said, "Make a long shot." I said, "Take the camera over there. You know, take it back." Well, that's you have a team of people with you, and if you're any kind of a good guy, they'll break their hearts for you. They'll do anything. And that's what's great about this business. And those that still happens. These crews here. I just got a note from one of the crew today. Uh, he was just thanking me for something at Christmas time. He said, "I love you." And he's a man loving me. <laughs> I got I got choked up. Were there? Did you ever go on any of those like location pictures, like uh, in the fifties when they'd have to go to Africa and stuff? Was that went, hard work? No, I never went to Africa. But wherever you go, it's hard work on a location. It seems as though in reading about it. That it wasn't all that glamorous in well, the fifties when you'd go on location, no, the accommodations. Well, with the Clark Gable picture across the wide Missouri, <clears throat> we all lived in tents and it was on a hill like that. There was five or six of us in this one tent and up the road, and the hot water was up there. Well, by the time they got it to us, there was no hot water. Just no hot water, and you had to work. You had to be on the set, and I'm the assistant director, and I'm in charge of all that. Half the time, I didn't have breakfast, just lunch, <laughs> or dinner, or Time to get a bath, and we worked a six-day thing up there in the mountains. And Gable would come to. We had a, our own big table, the tent where we had our meals. We we're right on the on the ro on the river there, and and up in uh, wherever it was. And uh, Gable's wife would come, and she 